welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in this episode I am honored to have back on the show Dr. Mike Isratel and just a little FYI for you guys as to why the podcast has been a little less frequent of late and I haven't been as consistent. Now this might be a justification uh, post hoc but I assure you that it isn't. I've decided that I'm going to take a different direction with the podcast moving forward and only record episodes that I want to record. And what I mean by that is I'm not just going to pump out podcasts for the sake of it. I will only record an episode or a discussion I have with someone who A, I want to talk to and B, I think is going to contribute some very unique and uh, insightful uh, information on a particular topic. So expect a little less but more from a less frequent podcast. Uh, But nonetheless, I had a discussion with Mike on Facebook, we were chatting away discussing uh, some of the potential factors that lead to muscle soreness and we had some really interesting uh, conversations which uh, he then proposed that we have a Skype so that we could talk about a little bit further and he suggested that we record our discussion uh, to make it public because it was rather uh, useful. And we did so last week, Uh, however the audio on my end went absolutely haywire for some unknown reason and we had to re-record the episode and hopefully uh, you guys enjoy this because I think there's a lot uh, that you can take away from this one. So in this episode we talk about muscle damage and what actually causes muscle damage and how that leads to muscle soreness. We also discuss whether muscle soreness is a useful proxy for hypertrophy and there's quite a bit of discussion uh, centered around how sore someone should be during a mesocycle if muscle growth is your goal and the ways in which people should be tracking soreness throughout uh, a mesocycle and how that can influence the adjustments they make to the acute training variables such as volume, relative intensity, so proximity to failure and absolute intensity, so load on the bar. There's uh, a lot to take away from this one, uh, so buckle up and enjoy. So Mike and I have had a chat last week and unfortunately due to technological issues, uh, we got all of Mike's audio recorded, which is the most interesting part, but the audio on my end didn't record, meaning that there is just silent for a few minutes and I'm not sure it would make much sense if I were to God bless you, Michael. Thank you, Um, sir. I'm not sure it would make a lot of sense if we were to just combine all of Mike's sentences because I don't think it would (laughs) give a complete uh, picture of the topic that we discussed. So, with that out of the way, we're talking about muscle soreness and the implications it has for training. And I guess we should start with the lens at which we view these kind of topics through. So, Mike and I come from quite different backgrounds. We ended the discussion last week on this and I think it's really important for people to understand. So Mike is the theoretical guy as uh, he likes to be known and is known, uh, which means that he wants to do things the best way and what is most optimal um, you know, in terms of what we understand from the science and how we then apply that in practice. Uh, and I'm not saying that that isn't something that I seek to uh, apply in my own training or with my clients, but coming from a background where, sorry for keeping you up, Mike, um, <laughs> someone who comes from a background of working with a lot of people, um, I realize that there is theoretically optimal and what we should be doing versus what people will actually be doing, which is generally much further away from that. And my job is generally to try and bridge that gap to get them to do something that is better than what they otherwise would have done. And over time through education and hopefully working with people, getting buy-in, building rapport and explaining to them the ins and outs of training, I can get them towards optimal. But it's a big leap for many people. And we have some differing, um, not opinions, but I guess ways of uh, applying uh, the whole muscle soreness to training uh, yeah, model, I guess. So first, let's talk about where you're coming from, Mike. So why is it important that uh, we do what's theoretically optimal out of the gates? 
So I think like uh, basically we'll get to the – shortly we'll get to the theoretical of what soreness is and how much of it is a good idea versus bad idea perhaps. And um, there's a situation where I think a lot of folks – start a mesocycle with too much volume and intensity, mm-hmm. especially if they have new exercises they haven't gotten used to, and they get a very a high level of late offset muscle soreness, which I think is suboptimal, and I think, uh, Jacob, you agree. Mm-hmm. And then, so the question is what to do after that, um, how to proceed in the mesocycle, granted that they do that. My position is... How does this question come about? Well, people usually ask me, let's say it's an athlete I'm coaching. Well, it's been a while since I've done that. Uh, I guess I coach my friends, right? So um, You don't have friends, you know, Mike. That's a lie. People who my parents pay to say that they like me. <laughs> the money comes in every month. They're as good as friends. <laughs> so once there was a PayPal snafu and these people didn't talk to me for a whole that's month. That's why I'm a personal trying. trainer, Mike. More people yeah, that hang, hang around me friends. and yeah, everyone's mm-hmm. like, wow, you're so popular. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. Yep, you're at a coffee shop with a client, and you're like, uh, this is my friend, and they're like, a uh, client, so you're like, right, let me, yeah, who's counting? So um, I think when people ask if an athlete says, or just someone, let's say somebody on the internet asks me, like, hey, like, you know, so I'm, I get too sore at the beginning of a mesocycle, what do I do about it later? My best answer would be, like, stop getting too sore at the beginning of a mesocycle. And if they ask me for a good answer, I give them my best answer. And if they say to me, well, you know, I really do need to train super hard at the beginning. I can't restrain myself. I get too excited. What do I do then? My answer is, well, can be interpreted accurately as a little bit dickish just to say, stop fucking doing that. You take them to the and dog start park. doing the right thing. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're like an like, excited look. little puppy. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, look, I mean, like, you know, it's almost like saying, you know, like every time I go hunting, I shoot myself in the foot, and then what do I do after that? The first thing is, like, you know, do you have your trigger lock on? They're like, well, no. Like, well, what do you think you should turn that on? Like, that's probably the best idea. Now, of course, if in the moment, in a mesocycle, someone's like, look, last week I got way too sore. It's my first week. What do I do? Now, then I have some good advice. And then the, my advice is pretty much identical to yours. But I don't like to approach the question first and foremost as, uh, okay, people are going to do this, so let's give them this intermediate advice. I mean, I think that's m- way more useful, what you're doing, way more practical. But I have, I'm have, i irked about it, and because there's tons of other brilliant folks in the industry, such as yourself, to tell them that, I'm not going to be another person. Because there's plenty of people to tell them that. I'm just not going to be one of those people. I'm going to tell them something else. Because I also think it's psychologically healthy for people to hear both things. Like, hey, Jacob Skepis is going to tell you what to do if you get too sore. Mike Israel is going to be the guy that still tells you not to get too sore. Mm-hmm. So... That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, awesome. And uh, I guess where I'm coming from is that I work with a lot of people who have a very hard time uh, refraining from doing too much uh, in the early weeks of a mesocycle. Uh, So what I try to do is obviously give them like an introductory week or weeks um, and it's pretty much damage control and trying to minimize, you know, the soreness that they get knowing that they will uh, feel better and better as the mesocycle goes on and then they'll start to experience a little more soreness uh, towards the back end of the mesocycle. Um, but yeah, my perspective is that you know until I generally have someone who's fully bought into the coaching process, uh, I very much have to mold the program around uh, you know their, their wants basically as opposed to what they need. Uh, it's a very fine balancing act for any coach, uh, balancing you know a client or athlete's wants and needs. And hopefully once you've got buy-in and you've uh, built some rapport and you can educate them a little bit more, you can give them more of what they need and you can actually transition what they think they want um, into you know, having their wants and needs line up pretty well. Uh, and that's when you get the best results, when they want the, the things that they actually need to be doing to get progress. Um, but yeah, anything you Brian. want to add to that? No, I think that's great. Cool. So muscle soreness, what is it, Mike? Let's uh, break it down and uh, I guess distinguish soreness and muscle damage because most people use those terms synonymously, but they're not exactly uh, the same thing. Uh, Do you want to talk about why that is? Yeah. You can have muscle damage without soreness, especially if it's a limited amount of muscle damage. You can have a quite high amount of muscle damage if it's muscle damage of a certain type without soreness. But you probably can't have soreness without some muscle damage. Um, if you could, that would be real gnarly. <laughs> uh, we'd, we'd be very hard-pressed to figure out why the soreness is happening. Um, I don't so much like 
to categorize lately, uh, people s- try to give timelines for delayed onset muscle soreness. They say, well, delayed onset muscle soreness typically hits at XYZ time and abates at XYZ time. And you actually do training yourself for even some number of you know, months. You realize that there's a spectrum of soreness. So I like to talk about soreness as a spectrum from no soreness at all all the way up to delayed onset muscle soreness that doesn't start until 48 hours after, which you can do if you fuck yourself up well and good. Um, and it doesn't stop being sore until a week or a week and a half after that. Right? And that's the kind that's associated with the tons and tons of muscle damage. Right? It is actually only triggered by uh, tons and tons of muscle damage because that's the only thing that tells your body enough damage has been done for immune system infiltration to occur. And the delayed part of delayed onset muscle soreness is a result of delayed immune and inflammatory responses, which are very closely tied together, in which various cells and uh, other components basically come into the muscle area and the muscle itself. They sometimes even unzip the the um, the cell uh, boundary and uh, you know basically start fixing things. And the macrophages eat up various components that have fallen out of the cell due to damage. And that all that unzipping and stuff basically allows all kinds of uh, you know um, you know uh, contents to spill out, further increasing creatine kinase levels, which is a marker for muscle damage doing actually more muscle damage. It's almost like uh, there's actually a really good analogy is uh, if a hurricane passes and it hits a skyscraper with some wind and some rain, you might get a couple of windows that are broken, right? Uh, and it's, it's not a big deal because some of them are just cracked, right? And there's actually no water coming through or very little. Some are broken, but just a little bit. And then you get a crew later to come in and fix it, right? So what does a crew do? They move entire window panes out. <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, if you look at the percent of window coverage you have, Two days after a hurricane hit when the crews already started working, because remember, they don't instantly show up. It takes a while for them to get there. Then you have half the skyscraper could have had just little mini cracks in the windows, but they have to replace all of them. So they have to literally remove half the windows, and all of a sudden, it's way more damage. I mean, it's more disruption to the, to the structure than anything the hurricane ever did. And this goes as extremely as if you have a building uh, damaged by a hurricane or I don't know, hurricanes don't do as much damage. Let's say it's a very small building and it's damaged down to the frame, like the frame is bent or p- parts of the roof have come off, then actually we can enter a process called cellular necrosis where the bar – I'm sorry, uh, either necrosis depending on it. Uh, so it, it, the cell becomes necrotic where it starts to die. And sometimes the immune system actually triggers or the cell itself triggers apoptosis, which the cell just kills itself because that's the, that's the analogy of your house is so messed up by the storm that, uh, that there's, no, there's no way out. There's no rebuilding. The rebuilding is a stupid idea because there's so much broken. It's actually harder to rebuild than to build a new. So then the construction crew comes and just knocks the house down. Right? That happens too now. That we really don't want that much damage in muscle growth, right? And there's for sure a good argument that if you do way excessive damage, you get you know, apoptosis and necrosis, real, real bad idea, right? But so we have that analogy. An analogy is a really good analogy, I think. But um, what, what really is a spectrum is, okay, so see people say, well, I don't have delayed onset soreness from this workout. And then I ask, okay, do you have any soreness at all? And because there's like, you know, after you did a bicep workout and you have no DOMS, Still, like an hour after the bicep workout, it, it's, it feels a little twingy, right? It's like, ugh, you don't feel my best. I feel like not pain, just a bit of diffuse discomfort in the muscle, especially in the tendon structures and you know, all this other stuff. And then it goes all the way up to like pretty legit discomfort, and all that goes all the way up to like pr- pretty profound weakness and discomfort that ends up being higher later, and that's delayed and onset muscle soreness. You basically get instant onset, very small amount of soreness. There's no soreness, instant onset, small amount. And then incrementally more delayed and more uh, sore, and then all the way up to super sore. That if you keep going, it's necrotic apoptotic soreness, which is just really, really terrible. Um, and that kind of stuff is difficult to do in advanced athletes, but possible. The most extreme scenario of that is when you have uh, apoptosis and necrosis in mass, and that is um, rhabdomyolysis, right? In which case your body's like, fuck that, get rid of all this, and it just pours giant globular proteins into the blood, and then they clog up your kidneys, and then you tell people that you're a warrior and everything's good. So uh, that is the spectrum I like to see soreness. So when people say like, oh, DOMS is a good idea or DOMS is not a good idea, they don't even like to say the term DOMS. I just like to say muscle soreness, uh, and that's correlated very well to the degree of muscle damage, even though the more extreme forms, the damage is exacerbated by the immune system. I just think that's part of the general discussion. So we can then – now if we've outlined it, and I'd love for you to let me know if I missed anything. That's the theoretical model of soreness, and I'd like to 
talk about how that relates to how much work we're doing and if it's too much, not enough. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, um, Chris Beardsley just uh, published an infographic, I'm not sure if you saw it, that had um, yeah, the inflammatory response and how that plays into muscle damage and how it kind of feeds back into creating more damage through yep. um, the reactive oxygen species and the lysosomal um, proteases and whatnot and how they cause more damage and um, sure. you know, it facilitates that process, which was really interesting. We also know that if we shut that process down, that we mute hypertrophy significantly. Mm -hmm. So we can't simply say like, wow, you know, that doesn't mean anything and it's just damage. And, it's and that's extra. through non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, NSAIDs. And or cold exposure. Yes. Does Ice the same baths. thing actually. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Cody Hahn actually just uh, summarized yes, the study. That. Yep, and it was like uh, some people did 10 minutes of cycle riding cycling after each workout. The cold some people did cold, and the cold people actually just didn't grow any muscle at all. So that's, that's real bad news. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but basically it teaches us to have a respect for the post-training window. That It's not maybe a magical time, but it's an important time, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe we should – my people uh, would always ask me what I thought about the post-training window. What's the best thing to do? And actually James Hoffman has the best answer. Eat, relax, and just leave the muscle the fuck alone for at least a couple of hours. <laughs> just don't do anything stupid. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to like super enhance it, and a lot of people ask another question, what do I do to prevent soreness, right? Or what do I do to get rid of soreness? Gee, you know, that's an interesting question, but it's, it's a perilous answer. It's, it's almost like saying, you know, what do I do about uh, mosquito bites on my trip to Guatemala for a vacation? You know, the best answer is don't go to Guatemala. You won't have to worry about it all. Then you don't have to worry about having any fun either because you're not on a trip anymore, right? So, Do people have fun in Guatemala? Yeah, you know, I've been told that's a, a, a uh, yeah, one of I've, the undiscovered I've vacation destinations. Well, yeah, it's kind of like Indonesia. You go, you get sick right. for a week and a half. <laughs> yes, I've so, had that experience in Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so, so basically – the sort of next question is, okay, now that we know soreness is a result of muscle damage and a combination of actual muscle damage, and usually that's the soreness that's really diffuse and really minor, uh, and the immune system infiltration uh, afterwards, right? Because, so if that's the case, what does soreness tell us? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to go back to a theoretical model of uh, hypertrophy. Yes. Well, that was my next question. Was, um, yep. mm -hmm. In 2019, uh, does Mike Isratel... Uh, believe there is a case for muscle damage playing a role uh, in hypertrophy. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, the degree of muscle damage has to be assessed. And also the question of is it a correlate or, or causative factor has to be assessed. Unfortunately, we probably don't know enough yet to answer that second question. We can't answer the question of degrees. So we know a couple of things. And this is really kind of my... Uh, uh, this method of analysis of a problem is one I really, really enjoy, and I think it's a very, very good method, is you take all of the stuff you know relatively well, and you put it all together in a way that makes the most sense. Um, I think it's a really good method, sometimes a little better than methods that take one thing and dive really deeply into it. And there's this other stuff that's never been explained and doesn't make any sense in context. You're like, ah, don't worry about that stuff, Right. And so even if one of the you know, pieces of data isn't super precise and we don't have all the answers, we can still get a real good big picture idea about what's going on. Like it, it's kind of like, um, you know, like, uh, you're like in a little wooded area at night and there's like uh, – you hear growling and you're like, OK, well, it could be a predator or it could be a, somebody's dog or it could be just a weird tree bark situation in the wind. OK. Get rid of that idea, and then another one is idea is that you're in the same wooded area at night. You see like some blood, and you could be like, "This is an animal bleeding," or it could be red paint somebody had, or or, or you could see you know uh, somebody screaming, and it gets like little kids having fun in the woods. The thing is, if you hear all those at the same time, you do see you all see those, somebody scream, or do you hear them scream? Sorry, so you're right. Well, I see I see the uh, auditory spectrum because I'm an advanced uh, Android, but mm. you probably hear it, which and is really inferior old way human. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not really human at all. So, um, But in any case, so if you have blood, somebody screaming, and predatory growling in the woods at night, you know, all of those by themselves might not mean uh, that you have to run. 
If you hear them all at the same time, fuck, man. I'll put it to you this way. We don't actually know with all of those if there is a predator killing people in the woods, but your boy's not sticking around to find out, right? Like, not. Nah. Like, best evidence is, at the very least, I'm just going to work on this, and if I ran, oops, right? So if we take this back to delay onset muscle soreness, here's the couple of things that we know. One, or tension and, and damage and so on and so forth. Number one is that... Uh, the more stimulus we expose a muscle to, to a point, the more growth we have. So we actually know that a growth is uh, dependent on the magnitude of the stimulus, which means more volume, more intensity, so on and so forth, right? The point is, from another theoretical idea we know, uh, we have pretty good insight to think that recovery and adaptation, at least to some extent, are drawn from the same cellular resources and the same systemic resources of the human body. So that if you are adapting, improving to a certain large extent, if you expose the body to anything more than that that requires recovery in addition, there's going to be some trade-off of that to some extent, right? So the trade-off is going to be at some point where any more stimulus imposed any more damage taken is going to cost so much in recovery resources that it's going to start reducing adaptation. So it might be a curve of adaptation where the more – so we get stimulus on the y-axis, right? Or I'm sorry, uh, degree of adaptation on the y-axis, amount of stimulus on the x. The more we go up, it probably starts to look like this, right? It starts to curve out, and the amount of recovery demand goes from very little to higher and higher and higher. When the recovery demand gets high enough, it hits a recovery and adaptive peak. As soon as it hits this straight line peak, which I would say by, by the week analysis is your MRV, when it hits this peak, it bumps up against the peak and it can't go any further, so it actually starts dropping down. And it drops down, pushing the adaptive processes to lower and lower heights, right? So once, once that happens, uh, then it's, you know, you're probably training too much and exposing the body to too much stimulus, and then actually doing less is a good idea, right? If we go back to tension and damage and delayed onset muscle soreness, we can apply this idea as follows. If, theoretically, if you're not getting sore at all, I mean at all, like not even a perceptive tension or perceptive, you know, sort of pain, just any kind of anything going, there's nothing, no tightness, no weird proprioceptive feelings, then the question can be rightly asked based on no other information whatsoever, and we have other good information we can talk about, are you doing enough to maximize the adaptive response? Right? Because we can envision a, a world in which someone's MRV per session or whatever, or MAV, maximum adaptive volume, the most volume you can do and, 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 or the, the, get the most growth per session, somebody's maximum adaptive volume could be eight sets per muscle group, right? If they do one set, will they get sore? God, no. Not even close. But they won't feel anything. And so they can say, well, I did a set. I'm good to go. I'll just progress from here on out. Progressive overload, man. Next time I'll do more weight. You can ask the question, like, what would happen if you did two sets? There's no good answer to that question short of, ah, fuck, I should probably do two sets at least next time. If not, go back in time and try it again, right? Because clearly they're so far on the other end of this curve here that they could add a ton of volume before they ever risk damaging anything too much, ever risk impeding recovery resources so much that it's not worth increasing. So if you never get sore, does that mean that you should be doing more work? No, because there's other indicators that are also as good or better. But it should give you the suspicion that maybe that's the case. Just like if you hear growling in the woods, it doesn't mean there's a predator in there. But you should be like, yeah, let's try to figure this out a little bit more before we run in there naked, covered in other people's blood. That's how I like to get predators to try to eat me. So – that's the case for never get sore. Let's jump real quick over to the other extreme is you get radical DOMS that doesn't even onset until two days after exposure and it lasts for seven days at a time. We have a bunch of problems with that. One of them is you'll miss out on a ton of quality work you could have been doing when you were recovered. Another is, gee, if that theory holds up, that there is an interference effect between recovery and adaptation or rather a, com a competition for the same resources – you're kind of in deep shit because god damn is your body trying to recover, right? If you really believe that there was no competition for it, you would just get into a car accident every month and it would take you a month to heal and you'd be fucking massive because that's maximum damage. But that's really just not the case, right? It's almost like saying, hey, like if we have 
uh, some pretty big rainstorms in Miami, eventually the companies are incentivized to put up really, really strong windows and strong, sturdy skyscrapers. It makes sense. It's going to improve the city's infrastructure. But if your idea of improving Miami is to take the mother of all storms and wipe it off the map, it's not going to improve. It's going to destroy it, right? Clearly, you, <laughs> that's too big of a storm. So if you're getting super fucking mega sore and it takes you days and days and days and days to recover – there is a good chance that you are not doing the most to grow. And this has actually been corroborated with at least a few papers. They sort of led the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the bearer of all of this is the Damas, the Damas series mm-hmm. of papers. Yeah. And they've shown that, you know, people in the beginning stages, uh, when they get, when they get tons of muscle damage, they seem to not grow much. And then when the muscle damage abates, they seem to grow more, which perfectly aligns with the theory. And is it, listen, beginners, you know, they have really, really low, minimum effective volumes. And a lot of times we expose them to protocols that were sort of a real world for intermediates, like four sets, five sets per session. Gee, for a beginner that's never done squats, I mean, that's the end of the world. That's for sure too much muscle damage to optimize growth. So it makes perfect sense. So now we know two things. We know that if you're getting super fucking megaton sore, there's a good chance you're not growing the most because you're doing a lot of damage and it's eating up resources you could have been using to uh, for recovery. You could have been using them for adaptation. On the other hand, if you never ever get sore, remotely sore, maybe you could do more. The last question pertinent to this exact focus of conversation mm-hmm. is how much soreness in the middle ground is optimal? The first answer I'll tell you is I have no fucking clue, but I think – Anywhere between just the most volume you can handle before you feel any soreness to intermediate soreness that takes eh, two or three days to abate, I think there's a good argument for that whole range being pretty fucking close to the optimal levels of soreness that correlate to growth. Um, And put it another way, the volume of stimulus it takes to get you there is probably pretty close to your maximum adaptive volume, right? Mm. So – that's – hopefully you're hearing me still. Yep. It says I have a poor connection. Um, that's sort of my ideas on that. So just to parlay this into a more applicable sense, I think that if you start a mesocycle, the volume and intensity or it's really just the volume and the correct intensity range should be such that you get just shy of sore or a little bit sore or even moderately sore. And then as you progress through the weeks, you should probably get just about as sore as you did the first time. How the hell do you do that? People say, well, hold on. You get sore the first time, but then the second time, third time, you get way less sore. But that's why you increase volume intensity as you go. So James Krieger actually cataloged his own personal experiment with it where he had a method where he added volume only when he wasn't sore anymore. And that means he added volume for like three months and he got up to lots of sets and grew a lot. and It was really good. So he chose to have no soreness at all present as the marker. I've chosen before to have moderate soreness present as the marker along with performance, which I'll get to in a sec. And it works super fine. So I think by that way, basically stay all in the same moderate soreness range, either no soreness or a little bit soreness the entire time. And every time your body wants to adapt to it, you give it more volume. And then the only exception I can see to that is the last week before deloading where you might want to go for a functional overreaching effect because during the deload, you'll have all this recovery window to do. And functional overreaching, as predicted by theorists of muscle growth, has been vetted recently in the literature. Um, so maybe the last week you can get a little north of that normal range. I still wouldn't go for crazy sore, but like soreness that takes three or four days to heal for every muscle group or or most of the ones. And then uh, that is going to be worked out in the end because it's going to get the late supercompensation effect that you're going to get some really good hypertrophy through your deload. You're going to drop all that fatigue and you're going to go on. So that's kind of how I see soreness and growth. So when people say things like, well, soreness doesn't mean anything or has nothing to do with growth, I'm skeptical if for no reason other than the correlation effect, um, which I can get to in a second. I don't want to ramble too long, but just just real quick, you know, people say soreness doesn't mean anything. Okay, so I can train in a way that doesn't make me sore at all, and I'll still grow. And like, yeah. Well, well, how the hell do I do that? Well, I have to have the lowest possible volume, no stretch under tension, no metabolite drive, n- zero effective reps, 
uh, you know, all of a sudden, gee, you know, that looks like a, a recipe for the least effective program possible. And then how do you get an effective program? Well, you have lots of those things. They make you a little bit sore. And then the only critique you can say is, well, if you have too much soreness, then that's bad. Well, yes, I agree, but that's soreness is meaningful. And, and just to counter that last point, I think some people say like, oh, if you're super fucked up and super sore, it doesn't matter. Just work through it. Like, gee, I don't think it doesn't matter. I think it's okay to work through it once or twice. But I think like if you're getting crazy fucking doms every week and it lasts a week, I would say there's a very good chance you're doing too much just based on the Dhamma stuff alone and all that theory. But my personal experience or experience with clients is very highly convinced me that that's the case. I've never seen anyone see it super fucking sore week after week after week and see their best progress. Yeah, I think um, where you were going with that initially and the way you mapped it out in the last time we discussed this, which was very useful, was if you were to take all the things we know, build muscle and remove those from a program, uh, you wouldn't get sore or any damage and that's probably not good for growth. So if you were to train with low volumes, low proximity to failure, as you were sort of alluding to, you know, you had no stretch under load, no eccentrics and you were training with, you know, bare minimum absolute intensities, yes, you would No, any... no novelty ever. You would do yeah, the same stale exercises yeah, yeah, for yeah. years. And uh, you wouldn't get sore but you probably wouldn't build muscle either and yeah, that um, is not really a recipe for, for muscle gain. Awesome. And uh, I guess to stem from there, as we kind of discussed, uh, you know, and I just outlined, you know, those primary factors that contribute uh, to, to muscle damage, um, what would you rank the order of you know, contribu contribution to soreness and muscle damage, uh, the variables within a training program? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, it's difficult to answer a question because some of the, the variables feed into the other ones mm -hmm. so much. Okay. Just for example, you could say novelty is the one that most correlates to soreness, but uh, novelty with very little volume, very little intensity is not going to make you sore. Mm -hmm. Like if you practice a new lift for uh, – do, do three sets of five with your 20 RM, it's a completely new lift and you did three sets. Are you going to get sore? No, <laughs> not at all, right? Unless – if that's the case, then going up a flight of stairs can make you sore if you haven't done it in a while. So um, I think that uh, the thing that makes you the most sore is volume. Uh, intensity insofar as relative intensity concerned, if you approach failure, you get more sore, um, which by the way is also hilariously indicative of uh, intersecting with the effective reps concept, which I think has some weight. Mm -hmm. So when people say soreness doesn't mean anything, I'm like, well, try getting a lot of effective reps without getting sore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good luck. Um, so I think that so volume and intensity there are key. And then I would say um, novelty, yes, but novelty of an exercise that exposes parts of your body, parts of your muscles in two ways. First of all, exposes them and they haven't been exposed at all or much recently and or exposes them in more damaging ways. So uh, stretches them uh, considerably, puts a lot of tension in the stretch position, does a lot of eccentric loading where that uh, muscle hasn't been used to that and so on and so forth. So I think novelty definitely plays a role. But like we talked last time, I, I pointed out, you know, if you're really used to flat barbell bench presses, and you switch to like a machine stack cable bench press, you can do like 10 sets of that. It will get you less sore than barbell bench presses. Well, it's novel. Well, because it, hit, it hits all your muscles in just about the same way except with less eccentric damage and probably less total volume of work set equated. So you end up just it's being easier. So there's nothing magical about novelty that makes you sore. It is the fact that certain – uh, motor units haven't been exposed to those kinds of stresses, period, or those types of stresses in that in that way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I, I think something that will be important to this discussion and considering that we're talking about novelty now uh, is the repeat about effect and how that plays into soreness. So do you want to discuss how the repeat about effect can reduce soreness um, in a second – third and potentially, you know, fourth uh, exposure to a training stimulus? Yeah, I mean, your body gets used to stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a real big fan of the repeated bout effect as a term. I'm not using that against you in any way. It's not well, so sound, term, making so myself not, sound, sound to be a cocksucker. Yeah, well, you, I, you should be offended because I hate the way you're using it. Okay. Um, but uh, so the repeated bout effect is an interesting term 
coined by exercise scientists a long time ago to describe a phenomenon that can really just be termed adaptation over time. Mm. You know, they don't a repeated bout effect hasn't been used, hasn't been a term that's invoked uh, explaining that people get way stronger session to session to session. But they do, especially in early nervous system uh, organizational gains, like you motor learning uh, gets gr- like really, really fast, right, in the first couple of weeks of training. And you get way, way better in exercise. Uh, you get way stronger. How come that's not termed the repeated bout effect? Well, it's a repeated bout. It's an effect. So I really think the, that's just a, a way to describe the fact that you know, what damaged you f- at first, the muscles adapted to, the other adaptations were made, more efficient motor patterns were selected, and now it takes more to damage you. It's the same as in any other form of adaptation. Mm-hmm. So that parallels the idea that you need to do more to grow as well, right? Not that damage necessarily causes growth, but m- you need more. You need more to damage, whether or not that's related or not, and you need more to grow, because the repeated about effect makes perfect sense, and that comes back to the idea people are like, well, I usually get super sore early in the mouse cycle, but then I don't later. Well, I assume you're sort of doing just the same amount of volume the entire time. They're like, well, yes. Well, you're, maybe that's a sign that you're not adapting your volume needs accordingly, <laughs> right? Um, and I think that anytime people say, well, if you're supposed to get really sore in the first week, no, that's just p- people – I don't assume being lazy, but that's just sort of traditionally – People don't bump up volumes, microcycle to microcycle to microcycle, nearly as much as I think they should. Um, and another way to say that is they start with way too much. Mm. And by the way, starting with too much is one of the highest correlates of injury of any sport practice is starting with too much volume. Mm. And I wouldn't think for a second that doesn't have anything to do with the, the correlates with delayed onset muscle soreness. If something is so traumatic as to cause that much muscle soreness, it could probably get you hurt too, which we find is absolutely the case. Mm. So when people say, you know, what about the repeated bout effect, treating it as its own independent weird thing to talk about, uh, I think it's necessary not so much. I think it's probably like, you know, if you train the right amount, you get a little sore and then you get a little sore and then you get a little sore and then you go sore and then you get a little more sore and then you deal it. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's my thoughts on the matter. Another interesting thing is this. I think that uh, training frequency plays into the repeat about effect in a very interesting way. If you train relatively infrequently, your muscles, in a sense, forget uh, how traumatic an event was and they lose some of their adaptations. And when you expose them again, they get more sore uh, or you know, more sore than they would if you train them more frequently. So for example, uh, you train your uh, biceps once a week train them on Monday and again on Monday, uh, you know, on Monday, if you train them for the first time ever, they get super fucked up because they've never seen that kind of training. On next Monday, you train them again, and it's almost like the first time ever all over again because they're like, fuck, I thought we were done with this shit, right? But if you train your biceps Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they have a really good deal of adaptation against soreness and for growth um, from Monday to Wednesday. You train them on Wednesday and your biceps are like, ah, yeah, we've seen this shit before and they never really get that sore. You train them again on Friday, like, yeah, we've seen this shit before and then you train them again next Monday and like, yeah, we've seen this shit before. Not only do you grow more because you can smash that many more sessions per week and get more juice out of it, but you also never have to experience a ton of pain because you're never essentially detraining much. I think that... Adaptive decay wasn't, uh, (laughs) is the term that I think you used. For sure, for sure. And that's maybe not adaptive decay in the sense that you're losing muscle size. That's probably unlikely week to Mm. week to week. But you're certainly losing the – probably the architectural adaptations within the muscle cell itself that prevent it from exposing itself to too much damage. And because – at very face value, because damage interferes with hypertrophy if excessive, that itself is a loss of of a really good thing You know that you want to keep around, which is why you don't want your frequency so low that you have to experience a ton of soreness. Now, um, that's on the one hand. There is a buffering system for that, not system. There's a buffering concept there, which is a mitigating concept that that basically says, look, if you get sore, yes, you do some damage, you interfere with growth, but then you have a super compensation effect that is delayed that makes up for at least some of that. So what I would say is if you get sort of not crazy sore, plenty sore training twice a week, how much more growth do you get? Moving to three times a week, we get almost no soreness at all. It's not as much more as you would expect, 
because you, you train three times a week, you get almost no delayed supercompensation effect. You get direct supercompensation. Um, but delayed supercompensation does occur with relatively infrequent training, twice a week, sometimes once a week for larger muscle groups. So I think that in that case, you can get similar results from training once a week or twice a week than three times a week or more. On average, you still get better results training more frequently, but I think the supercompensation effect can you know, can mitigate the expectation like, well, man, if I just train four times as much, I'll get four times as much growth. That's not nearly the case. Um, but you do get more growth. So I think when people say, well, you know, uh, for me, you know, uh, I don't experience soreness anymore because I train with high frequencies. How do you explain that? Well, you sure as hell cause just as much muscle damage. You just cause much less immune reactive damage to it because you're so used to experiencing the muscle damage that your body is like, ah, we're cool. We can fix this locally. No big deal. But the, in, the initial muscle damage caused by training is actually multitudes higher because you expose your body to so much more training. Um, it, it's a funny thing too to talk about with people when they're like, well, soreness is just a low frequency phenomenon. If you train with high frequencies, you don't get sore and that's great. But like, okay, well, you know – you're still causing as much or more damage. And they're like, no, I'm not. Like, yeah, well, try training high frequencies for eight months straight. And they do. And they're like, hey, my knees came off my, 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 my body when, when I squatted. I'm like, surprise. <laughs> right? So you're still doing much more damage. And now that soreness isn't a big deal, you have to be very careful about measuring damage in other ways, specifically with performance, how your joints feel, connective tissue, so on and so forth. It's very easy to get on a high frequency train and be like, I'm never sore. I'm going to train forever. And then all of a sudden, you're in a really, really bad place. Yeah, lots to unpack there and some really interesting points. But I wanted to discuss uh, the paper we uh, had a chat about uh, in the last uh, discussion we had, which was the FLAN paper uh, from 2011, which I found super interesting. Uh, so for listeners, I'll just give uh, the meat and potatoes of this study. Over 11 weeks, they had uh, a ramping group versus a naive group, and the ramping group basically uh, you know, slowly increased uh, the stimulus in the workouts and they measured uh, soreness, damage and muscle growth. And then in week four, they had a naive group come in and basically pick up the program at week four and they experienced uh, a lot more soreness and damage in that first week uh, and then it dropped back down and slowly tapered off uh, over the course of the next seven weeks. Whereas the ramping group uh, had a pretty constant level of soreness and damage uh, below the damage threshold, uh, which was interesting. They both got the same gains. And I think this study is interesting because it kind of reflects what people do in practice, which is the naive group. They'll just come in and start a program, get a lot of damage, a lot of soreness, and then you know, due to adaptive processes, the soreness and damage drop significantly. Um, and then as they increase the stimulus, it kind of picks up again. Uh, whereas what Mike's suggesting and what I would definitely recommend to most people is ramping up. But um, yeah, I think an interesting point there is that um, the week one of the program was like 100 kilojoules, you know, on this recumbent bike. So they weren't even using resistance training. It was like this eccentric uh, bike. Um, it was like 100 kilojoules in a session. So I don't know how hard that uh, training actually was, but nonetheless, I, I think this is really interesting. So Mike, what do you think <clears throat> in terms of because in fact both groups uh, experience soreness um, rise in week one and then drop back down after that uh, initial session so does this kind of parallel with what we see in practice when people do experience a lot of soreness in the initial weeks um, and then it drops off even despite increasing the stimulus yeah totally I think that there's a potential there where the increase, the decrease in muscle soreness isn't correlated with growth nearly as much so that maybe the novelty aspect, um, for whatever multitude of reasons, everyone is going to get, no matter how little you do, you're going to get more sore in the first week than in many other weeks. And maybe that's just something to sort of take in, into account and understand that will happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, although I would have to see a lot more data relevant to that to prove that it's not my first suspicion my first suspicion is that they're still doing too much in week one combined with not increasing enough over the weeks um in volume because yes the study did lessen the first week and then ramped but there's not really a question of did they ramp enough you know one of the ways in which we ramp uh training the way james krieger ramped his training the way I ramp my training in many of my auto-regulated models is with soreness taken into account so that if you're not 
getting as sore as you used to when we, you know, we pick some kind of soreness that we think is decent, then you, by definition, do more. This was not done in the study, Mm -hmm. right? They didn't say, hey, how sore did you get last time? And they said, you know, one to 10 scale. And if they said anything below a three, they gave them more. And if they said anything above a three, they gave them nothing else, right? That would be our regulated ramping. That might have really interesting effects on hypertrophy, right? Um, That remains to be seen how that would play out, right? But, uh, you know, it's it's really tough from one study like this to really zoom in. So there's a problem with analyzing one study at a time. As soon as you zoom in deeply enough to try to really get at some interesting stuff, you've zoomed in deeper than the study actually allows with uh, error, error rates and the clarity of its, the power of its statistics. It's, it's kind of like saying like uh, <laughs> you get on a, like a Walmart scale and your friend weighs 220.1 and you weigh 220. Like who's actually heavier is it your friend? Well, actually, the scale is not rated. To, if you read the manual, it says anything between half a pound is just error. Right? So if you debate heavily about who was actually heavier, you're debating a completely fucking pointless issue because there's not enough uh, data precision to tell you anything. So I think the study, you know, as every individual study is, one in which we say some very interesting stuff happens, some stuff we expect, some stuff maybe we don't. Um, but uh, you know, we would have to have more and more studies. So, uh, bring something up real quick. The groups both grew the same, right? Um, directly conflicts with Damas research. Because in Damas research, the very highly damaged people didn't grow when they were being damaged. So how the fuck did the second group grow the same? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe we need – maybe it was both groups, groups were underdosed. Maybe it was the ramping group. The ramp was just enough to abate the soreness but not nearly enough to grow muscle. Um Maybe they started too light. Maybe they never ramped high enough, right? There's, there's all these speculations that are completely pointless speculations, by the way, because we're just pretending at this point. But it's one of those things where, you know, what do we take away from the Flan study? Well, we take away the fact that ramping is an effective way to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness. And that – because somebody could say, like, it doesn't matter how much you ramp. Novelty is what triggers soreness. Even a set of an exercise is going to fuck you up. That's just clearly not true, and that the study proves that super well, um, or at least you know in this study it is proved super well. What the study says in body, the, the, sort of in light of the rest of the body of the literature, is not clear because it's just one study. It could all be fake. Some grad student could have typed it up on his computer and just made it up, right? That happens, by the way. <laughs> so or the, the equipment was radically uncalibrated, and you just have no idea what the hell's going on. So, like the paper is really cool, but I think in light of all the other papers on soreness. Um, I'll put it to you this way. If I had to make a very soft recommendation, if people really weren't buying this stupid Israel bullshit of soreness means a lot and we can really like use it as a regulating marker, uh, that's fine. I, you may very well be right. I may very well be exaggerating the effect or the detective uh, importance, of, uh, importance of soreness. At the very minimum, what I would say is this. <laughs> uh, there's an argument to starting a mesocycle a little bit even at the very least with a little bit less volume. So am I saying that you start most mouse cycles with three sets per exercise and ramp up all the way to 10 over the course of two months? I may not be. I think that's probably a good way to do it. If you say, you know, the average there is what, like six, right? Six or seven. Let's say six is the average there. Uh, if you're like, no, I think a mouse cycle that starts at six sets and just adds intensity over the course of six sets and ends at six sets is ideal. I would say to you, look, I don't want you necessarily to buy my three to 10 progression versus your six and straight progression, but at least start with four and maybe end with seven. So like four on the first week, six, or or, sorry, but not even four, fuck it, five, at least five, right? Like start with five on the first week. It'll be a little less than six. You're a little less sore than you normally do in your first week, which I think is a good thing at the very least from injury prevention standpoint and probably for hypertrophy as well. And then fine, do six, 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 six. And then the second to last week of your mouse cycle, the last week of accumulation, try seven because you've got nothing to lose, man. If you do seven the last week, you're going to be, you're not going to get hurt. You're going to get the functional overreaching effect has been very well documented. As long as you deal with next week, you can do a lot more in the short term. And that's actually a really cool concept from sports science. In the short term, you can benefit from a lot more than you can ever survive in the long term, right? An overreach is definitely possible, and it's definitely a good thing if it's controlled, and controlled means you actually take a deal with it after. 
So I would say to the person, well, at least start at five and then end at seven, but you could do sixes all the way through. Once they try that, they'd be like, and you know what? That was actually a really better metacycle all the way around. Maybe next time I'll start with four and end with eight. And then all of a sudden, I have no critiques of the program because, you know, between four and eight, it's all nuance, man. I have no idea who's right. Um, so, so if I was betting now, I would say, hey, as we're told, there's three, starting at three sets roughly and going all the way to 10 sets or so. Is that the best? And do people start at four and end at, you know, uh, nine? Are they just totally stupid? Uh, no, I have no idea, right? But I will say that people that start at four and go to nine, probably onto something I would bet is more effective than just six, 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 six all the way around. And, and lastly, while I'm on my rant, if you think that volume ramping is stupid in general, why do you think intensity ramping is a good idea? I don't know. Why the fuck do you add weight to the bar? Why do you go closer to failure? Maybe you should always go to failure and never add weight to the bar. Why would you even add reps? And then we start to getting, well, you know, if you don't at least add reps, the sets get farther and further away from failure, right? The RIR drops, uh, and we know that very low RIRs probably correlate with poor gains, correct? We also know very low volumes correlate to poor gains. We also know that more volumes cause more gains as far as set numbers. So why aren't you ramping your sets? Nobody ever fucking has a good answer to that question. Um, and that's simply sort of where I want people to think. And I think soreness is a pretty good guide and another piece of general evidence to the idea that volume ramping to some extent, not necessarily crazy extremes, is probably something that deserves at least a second thought. Yeah. No, I mean, I uh, completely agree with that. And what I uh, like to do programming-wise in terms of ramping is assessing soreness, recovery, and performance, uh, which I think is super important. So a lot of people will overstate or understate the role of uh, soreness in a, as a proxy for uh, hypertrophy. And I, I created that model just recently where I had uh, you know, over the course of various timelines and the, uh, I guess, degree of predictive power of, that a, <clears throat> excuse me, proxy has for muscle growth. And, you know, in an acute sense, you know, we have uh, the pump or the lactate effect that we experience when we train. And then over the course of days, we have soreness. But what we really should be looking for over time is improvements in performance, so repetition strength across multiple sets. So do you want to speak to, I guess, uh, that, that model that I sent you and uh, how people often miss the forest for the trees in these kind of uh, discussions and should think uh, holistically and, and big picture about uh, how soreness sort of plays into their overall results? Yeah. Let me uh, integrate your model into a slightly i don't think i've ever actually come out and said this exact thing first time um G, is this that your jp is this jps or is this your private podcast uh, i don't have a private podcast so no is, that's not uh, not what your secretary told me when she booked this so. <laughs> um so first time ever on jps here we go we have the question of how much volume to add as we progress through a mesocycle. And we also have the question there, one of our indicators is performance, right? So we know a couple of things. If you're getting weaker <laughs> for reps, week to week to week, one of two things is happening. Your accumulated fatigue is uh, increasing way too fast. And what do I mean by way too fast? Too fast for what? Too fast for you to present an overload. How the fuck are you supposed to present an overload if you're getting weaker all the fucking time, right? Or two, uh, you're actually doing so much volume that you're degrading your fitness because fitness and fatigue are sort of additive, right? Uh, you're actually making your muscles, regardless of fatigue, smaller and weaker and weaker because you're doing way too much volume. Definitely a possibility if you're getting weaker. Both of those are bad for sure. So we want to make sure that as we progress through a meso, the question of do we add more sets, uh, the answer to that is never like, well, we're getting weaker, so yes. <laughs> okay, If we're getting weaker, do not add sets. At the very least, probably it's time for some kind of a recovery session, recovery half week, recovery week, deload, something like that. So okay, we know that. Performance can tell us if it's dropping. Bad things definitely don't add volume. There's another question. What about on the other end of the spectrum? Performance is increasing. Okay, is that a good thing from just purely hypertrophy perspective, right? For strength, it's a little bit different. Well, 
it can be a good thing because it can mean that your fitness is increasing, right? Like what you're doing is making you better, stronger and bigger. And that's good. So that's good. So there's a plus side there. Plus what about the other column of what else it's telling you? And it can be telling you the following that you are not accumulating fatigue because the volume is so small and your fatigue accumulation may actually be falling. So you've had, you, you came into the mess cycle with this much fatigue and let's say you're doing one set of an exercise. Peaking programs do this intentionally. Peaking program lowers the volume or starts with a very little volume and never increases it. And it actually brings your fatigue down. So your performance goes like this. Now, hold on a second. Peaking programs don't grow you. They do the opposite. They, they maintain your muscle. If anything, if you do them for too long, they cost you muscle because in essence, you are providing such a tiny stimulus that you're not getting any better. Now, your fatigue is falling because that tiny stimulus doesn't pour into fatigue and fatigue uh, uh, you know, actually just reduces instead of accumulates. So if you say to yourself, how do I interpret improvements in performance week to week to week of a mesocycle? And you say, improvements are good. That might not be true. Does that make sense? It might actually mean that you're underdosing your volume. Now, what is the safest bet? Here's something trippy I've never said in public, and I'll be writing about it in the Hyper Free book and all this other bullshit. Here's a safe bet. Your performance is stable. If your performance is stable, rule ad sets. What the fuck? How is that possible? Well, we did a certain amount of work. Performance is stable. That means we probably didn't lose any muscle, right? Fatigue probably isn't going crazy. And, uh, you know, we may have gained muscle, but we're not sure, okay? If you add volume to that the next week and performance is still stable, we know that your fitness is improving. How? Because fatigue accumulates if you add volume. But how the fuck are you getting better while fatigue is accumulating? Well, you have to actually be improving your underlying fitness. Does that make sense? Like your actual muscles are getting bigger or stronger or whatever. But the result is because fatigue is going up, but your abilities are going up, they cancel out and the performance is stable. So if the performance is stable, you add volume. If the performance improves at some point, like holy shit, either I'm growing a fuck ton to cancel out that much fatigue or probably more than likely because I keep ramping – I'm just not accumulating as much fatigue as I could be if I really was fucking training hard. So then you add even more volume if you see intra, uh, intra mesocycle improvement. Microcycle to microcycle improvement probably means you could do even more volume in addition. So as long as your volume is stable and never falls off, so basically you start a mesocycle here, you do X performance. If performance goes up, you add plenty of volume. If performance goes up, you have plenty of volume. But if performance is stable, you add a little bit of volume and a little bit and a little bit as long as it's still stable. If it ever goes down, uh, too much, time to deload, right? So your target for an average mesocycle, especially for intermediate and advanced folks, because beginners can make jumps that you just can't obviate with any volume at all because a lot of that's neural learning stuff. For intermediates and advanced folks, I think there's a really good argument to be made that your performance goal should be stability rep conversion stability throughout the mesocycle and that if you really start to overreach your recovery abilities, you're going to get a dip and that's the detection of MRV. You cut it off and you're done. But if you have stable performance, here's, here's the big sort of the big kicker and I've already said it, but it, it, it bears mention again, if you're increasing your volume and your performance is stable, that means your cumulative fatigue is increasing, but your performance is ma maintaining, which means underlying abilities are, must be rising which means you're probably fucking adding muscle, right? So my view on this is if tracking performance is critical and more important than tracking soreness for how you're doing a mesocycle. Mesocycle to mesocycle, you had better be improving your fucking performance. If you're not, you're really fucked up. <laughs> like something's really, really wrong. Um, but microcycle to microcycle within a hypertrophy meso, I think the best, most conservative target it, you know, because of the fact that these things are very mysterious and are difficult to measure, I think is roughly performance stability. Maybe slight improvement to stability is ideal. Performance decline, shitty for 50 different reasons that I mentioned. Performance increase that's really fast, man, you might just not be accumulating as much fatigue as you can. The last thing I'll say is a bunch of studies confirm this. A bunch of the studies, uh, and, and especially this was seen, I think, in the Radielli study and the replication by uh, uh, Krieger and Schoenfeld, is that people uh, who, who grew the most muscle were in the highest volume group. Their strength gains weren't that much better than the other folks. So when someone says, listen, 
why don't why do you jump in volume to maintain your strength through a metal cycle? Why don't you do less volume and increase your strength even more? My question to them would be what correlates most within a mesocycle to hypertrophy, how much volume you can safely smash in or how much stronger you get. They say, how much stronger you get? I'd be like, great, I got a perfect hypertrophy cycle for you. It's a peaking cycle, starting at three sets, going to one and deloading. You'll get super fucking strong. They'd be like, that's perfect. It's going to grow me muscle. No, it's fucking not. So it turns out that uh, smashing as much volume as you can without getting weaker is probably more correlated to hypertrophy than the intramicrocycle improvements that you see. Ta-da. <laughs> Yep, I I like it. I actually thought about this. I think it was around eighteen months to twenty four months ago, because I saw all these people training for hypertrophy and talking about how their strength was going up, uh, you know, all the time. That's and they a fucking were, and problem, they were, right? And they were adding weight to the bar, and I said, and I was thinking, I'm like, well, that's not necessarily indicative of muscle growth because it's essentially a peaking program. Uh, if your fatigue so low. That you mm-hmm. know, because I, I think I'm not sure if you did discuss this. I don't think you did, but basically, folks, when fatigue drops, and even if your fitness uh, stays the same, so you haven't uh, built muscle or increased your strength, your performance even if increases. it's dropped off a little bit. Yes, mm-hmm. because performance is fitness minus fatigue. Uh, mm-hmm. So that is a, a very sound case for having the necessity for training under fatigue uh, during a mesocycle and not yes. necessarily seeing improvements in strength. But I think what we need to sort of unpack there is I feel a lot of people will think that that means, oh, well, you don't add weight to the bar because they see strength as adding weight to the bar. And I, I'm confident, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but that's not what you're saying. What you're saying is you shouldn't see necessarily performance improvements. So hitting personal best uh, for you know a certain rep, target across multiple sets with a given load uh, within a mesocycle or every week of a mesocycle unless you're a beginner but you should be assessing that from mesocycle to mesocycle and there will be load progression during the mesocycle it just might not necessarily result in a personal best every single week or session yeah exactly so um, I think that the, so the way I program is I usually program intensity jumps they're very small like let's say we're doing incline barbell presses I put two and a half kilos on the bar pretty much every week, right? And the thing is I start at like three or four RIR with a set of 10 as the first set. I end at zero RIR with a set of 10 with maybe 15 kilos more on the bar. If you convert the performances, they're roughly the same, like the same impressive. So if you walked in and you saw a bodybuilder doing uh, – he stopped like – clearly stopped like four short of failure with 90 kilos – first 10 to 10, you're like, wow, that guy's pretty strong. And then you looked over and another guy about the same size did 100 kilos, but for a fake grinder, fucking one last rep set of 10, you'd be like, who's, who's stronger? Somebody come up, who's stronger? Be like, "Mm, it's really just about the same. You know what I mean? Like one guy pushed harder. So that is, I'm the first guy in microcycle one and I'm the second guy in microcycle seven or whatever, six, whatever I finish. Um, And I think that basically means I didn't lose any strength while accumulating a fuckzillion amount of fatigue, and fatigue does accumulate, what happens after I deload, man? I deload and 90% of that fatigue is gone. The next time I come in incline press, I'm hitting 100, 410, 4 RIR. And the holy fuck, man, I'm going to be up at 107, you know, by the end of that process. So I think if you say, well, now what if you pushed it harder during, you pushed more volume, well, you just get weaker. And then I don't, man, you got to dig your way out of that hole, right? There is a small argument for if you got weaker, you could still have a really good rebound effect and the underlying, you know, that's just a lot of cumulative fatigue and actually you just still get kind of got stronger, but you have no way of guaranteeing that. Then you say, well, what if you didn't progress as much and you uh, didn't accumulate as much fatigue and you hit better progress? Uh, there is a very interesting argument there, but the problem is you can never be too sure what, what combination of your performance increase is coming from you just didn't accumulate enough fatigue versus you actually underlying systemic uh, adaptations or your local adaptations have been better. Because, I, I mean, ideally, you'd have a way to measure adaptive magnitude locally every fucking workout, and you'd be able to just turn the dial like five 
like some weird adaptive units. There's a you know zero to ten, and then ten is anything above five is too much and it causes too much damage. Anything below five is uh, too little. You just aim for five. You do like you do like a set of incline presses. You put the needle up to your quad, or sorry, your quad incline press with your quad. Put it up to your chest, and you're like, okay, it's set of two. You do another two sets, it's set of four. You do one more set, it's set of five. Shut it down, fellas. That's it. Like I fucking wish we had that, right? But we don't have that. So I think you can never be too sure if you're not pushing it hard enough versus uh, you're you're pushing just enough. So I like that stability model. I'm very open minded to just small uh, progressions. I think that's okay. But I'll put I'll put you this way. If you, for weeks on end, are putting weight on the bar and they have the same RIR, you're probably not doing enough volume for optimal hypertrophy. Is that how you design a strength muscle cycle? Yeah, pretty much, right? Like, who can who can dog you for doing 200 kilos, 202 two hundred two point five, two hundred five, two hundred seven point five, and every week you're rating RIR two, RIR two, RIR two when you hit fives? Your coach is going to look at that and be like, "Dude, you're the fucking man." He'd be like, "What should we change? Nothing. Don't fucking change anything. We're going to milk this as long as we can. This is this is the core of strength improvement here." But for hypertrophy, gee, you know, you're not really accumulating any fatigue, seemingly, or certainly not enough. And someone said, what do you mean accumulating enough fatigue? We don't want to accumulate fatigue. No, but we want the volume that drives growth that's going to pour that fatigue in. So I would say that small increases are okay, but if you're increasing like every week, you're just two and a half kilos, two and a half kilos, two and a half with no end in sight, you should probably do more sets because you can get more growth. Will you not get as strong in the short term? Totally. But remember, the point isn't exactly to get as strong. And, and my last point here is if you look at correlates of what bodybuilders can do versus powerlifters can do – you got to remember that first set performances correlate really well to hypertrophy, but multiple sets performances correlate better to hypertrophy. So you get somebody like Kai Green, he can you know incline 405 for you know probably like it takes him four sets to do 50 reps on the uh, 405 on the incline. You get a really good powerlifter could incline press 455 for the same number or more reps on the first set, but then the second set's three, then one, then zero, <laughs> right? So that. Uh, your ability to do multiple sets per session without as much rep drop off is probably the most correlated thing to hypertrophy. So anytime you beat yourself up and say, man, I could be getting so much stronger for my first set of 10, this stupid hypertrophy bullshit, I have to get really fatigued and I never make these great gains. Well, yes, but at the end of those mouse cycles, you will be bigger and your rep endurance at any weight will get bigger and all of a sudden, you know, you're going to be uh, way bigger than before. And just, just to put a really fine point on it, if uh, somebody like Ray Williams came to you and says, I know this is weird, but I want bigger legs, like I'm done powerlifting, would your goal be to improve his one rep max in a squat? Mm, that would be fucking ridiculous. Would your goal be to improve his 10 RM? Yes. What would be the best goal? Probably to improve his 10 by 10, 5 by 10 is a good start. Improve his 5 by 10 on the squat. And if you do that, uh, you know, or leg press and stuff like that, you will for sure have bigger quads. Yeah, and you just recently posted uh, an IFBB pro, Joe, Joel Thomas, uh, benching like Fuck. four plates for 20 reps or whatever it was. 21 um, reps, 21 strict, reps. clean reps. Yeah, and he even paused on the last like two or three reps just for shits and giggles. <laughs> just to rub it in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I think people will then turn around based on what you said, Mike, and say that, well, does fatigue lead to muscle growth and I would point them in the direction of Greg Knuckles recently published article on uh, effective reps and at the very end of that article he proposed a model for hypertrophy and he had uh, mechanical tension having you know a causal relationship with growth uh, but then fatigue and or metabolic stress so lactate uh, deoxygenation acidosis as having sure. um, yeah. That's why we call it metabolite effect because it's yeah. a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. Um, very, very good points by Greg. That was an excellent article. Mm -hmm. I will say, even if Greg and I, because we and, and a bunch of other people share the same views that metabolites still have a foot in the race, um, mm -hmm. even if we're wrong, I think that you can take, look at it like this. Even if fatigue doesn't cause hypertrophy, fatigue is correlated to how much tension you can expose the body to. And how much tension you could expose the body to is correlated to hypertrophy. Like if you're saying, okay, I'm doing three sets per session per muscle group and someone says, hey, why don't you do like work up to six sets per session? If you answer no, that's not a good idea to that six idea, you have to come back to the fact that almost all the studies find that six sets per session is better than three sets per session in the long term. How do you argue with that? I don't know. So when we say like – Accumulating fatigue is an, a, at least a necessary evil during a mesocycle. 
because of the fact that fatigue accumulates with how many sets you do, almost linearly. And how many sets you do, provided that you don't get weaker and can't recover, the more sets you do, probably the better your results are, as long as you're not exceeding a crazy number of sets, like eight or 10 sets per session, which if you're training two, two three times a week, is just really a fuck, low, fuck zillion amount of work. And if you do that many sets per session and still try and uh, to maintain performance within two or three weeks, you're going to start to tank anyway. So as people are like, well, I can do like 15 sets per session and my performance never declines. Uh, maybe I'm just working on the other end of the bell curve. Like, I just never met anyone that can do that. Uh, and if your performance never declines and you're still accumulating that much fatigue, you probably are again, because fatigue is accumulated. You probably are increasing your muscles, uh, uh, sort of local ability to produce force. And that probably means you're adding muscle size. Perfect. Perfect. And yeah, I guess uh, any final uh, suggestions, recommendations for people in terms of how they use soreness as a proxy uh, within their training programs? What would you be, be your final uh, yeah. you know, key points and summary of what we've discussed? Yeah. Don't chase soreness, but if you're not sore at all, it's okay. But if your performance is stable or increasing, try adding some volume. If you're super fucked up and super mega sore, that's okay. But I probably would maintain set numbers week to week until that soreness got reasonable. And then I would consider progressing. Awesome. And Mike, the hypertrophy book, The Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy, is going to be re released next year. And I mentioned this to you last time uh, when you were explaining on the Revive Stronger podcast back in 2017 that, uh, yeah, you don't set goals and you just try to be better, man, and do more good for the industry and be a fucking philanthropist and all that kind of stuff that you wanted to have this Certainly like, never said that. scientific <laughs> principles of uh, hypertrophy book by t 2023. And, you know, but that's a lofty goal and you don't really set goals and all this kind of stuff. But you've done it and it, almost done it and it will be ready next year. So is there an ETA on a the book what's the uh, projected timeline we don't want to get people we want to under promise over deliver so we're saying 2020 when we have a final copy in the hands of the last editing team we'll make a post about it on social media and let folks know that the book is coming early or late 2020 uh probably early, early. yeah awesome. but i swear to god if someone messages me january 1st and says where's the book i'm gonna send them a virus <laughs> Mike, thank you very much for your time. Informative as always. Enjoy, uh, where are you? My, Miami, where did you say? Los Angeles? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Fuck, it's all the same. It's America. It is all the same, except Las Vegas looks like that where there's nothing, just mm. nothing around. Yeah, that's exciting. Well, uh, enjoy. Like Australia, a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> Pretty much, man. Uh, enjoy <laughs> the Olympia, Mike. Thank you for your time, and we'll speak to you very shortly. Thanks so much.